are so happy to see you all here. What a beautiful group. And I know there are many places you could be right now, both within and beyond the conference, and just really honor that you've chosen to be here in this space. Um, and I love Adrienne Marie Brown, who's written many books, one of which is Emergent Strategy, talks about trying to find the conversation that only the people in this room can have. So I invite us into that space together today. Um, so yeah, my name is Stephanie Knox Steiner. I'm a professor at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. And I'm here, two of my beloved students, Doani Thakar and Abby Chikarone. Abby, am I saying that right? I don't know that I've ever actually said your, your, it's okay. your last it's name out loud. It's um, Chikarone and Cecile's here too. Cecile is here also, and Cecile is, oh, there's Cecile. I didn't see you, Cecile. Yay. So there are four of us here from the University for Peace. And um, we planned this session as an open dialogue. Um, to open, I'll offer a little invocation and a grounding, and then share a little bit about what we mean by the pedagogy of howling, because we do mean literal howling. <laughs> And we'll we'll explain about that. And then um, I'll invite Dwani and Abby to both share. Um, and yeah, maybe when we, we get into the story, we'll just kind of pass it back and forth. And then we have some questions to invite you all into as well. But we're, we're excited you're here. And we're ex excited to explore this topic of the pains and possibilities of trying to reimagine higher education from within with you all. So with that, I'd love to invite us to just settle and arrive here together. And I will invite you to just notice how you're arriving today. You're welcome to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you, or just maybe look away from the computer screen, find something beautiful or neutral just to gaze at. And I invite us to take three nice deep breaths together. The first breath, honoring yourself just as you are showing up today. Another deep breath for this shared Zoom space, the 15 beings in squares connected to hearts and territories, breathing into our shared space. And the third breath, inviting us to connect with everything that is supporting us, holding us, both that which we can see and that which we cannot, the earth, the Zoom connections, Wi-Fi, birds, lands, rivers, breathing for what is holding, supporting us that connects us. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a, a little invocation as we begin. Welcome, welcome, dear friends. Welcome, enchanted yearnings. Welcome, dreams and wild things and passion, purpose, burnings. Welcome, reimaginings and welcome, questions churning. May this be a space for us to explore our deepest learning. Welcome. As you're ready, you're invited to bring your attention back to the Zoom screen. 
And as we begin, you're welcome to put your name, um, the territory where you're calling from, and uh, anything else you want to share by way of introduction into the chat. Um, so I am calling you from Huetar territory in Costa Rica. And uh, I'm calling, I have the beautiful view of the Rio Pacacua in front of me and some mountains and volcanoes. And this morning I was visited by uh, a troop of monkeys <laughs> who were hanging from my roof, much to my dog's dismay. <laughs> And uh, that was that was how I began my day. Um, I also began my day very much in this question of pain and possibility of reimagining higher education. I'm in the first third of teaching this peace education course um, that I teach at the University for Peace. And the course structure is very intense. We we have classes, basically what would be in an, an traditional university, a semester long class, but we have them in three week blocks. Um, so they're very intense and the schedule is very exhausting. So I woke up this morning, my voice was kind of hoarse, had a bit of a headache and shoulder ache um, just from working within the structure, the schedule that we have. Um, but then uh, also with a very full heart from what we were able to experience as a class together this week. Um, that's a little bit of what I'm I'm bringing with me this morning. So I feel very much in in the thick of it of the pains and possibilities, and some of that pain being actual physical pain from from working within the structure. Um, so the University for Peace, um, it's an it's a really interesting place. It's a very beautiful place. It's a complicated place. Um, and I wanted to share the mission with you. Um, the mission is to provide humanity with an international institution of higher education for peace with the aim of promoting among all human beings the spirit of understanding, tolerance, and peaceful coexistence to stimulate cooperation among peoples. I'll just, there's more to it, but I'll leave it there. Uh, the university was founded by the United Nations about 45 years ago. It's not funded by the United Nations, but it has a, a strong connection with the UN. Um, and it's it's in Costa Rica, it's in Latin America, um, it's in the global south, but then it has the structure of a westernized university, what Ramon Grofoge refers to as the westernized university. Um, and then we also, so we have the hierarchies that um, traditional modern universities hold. And then we also have embedded within the structure some new hierarchies as well. Um, my dog Daisy says hello. <laughs> and so that's a little bit about where we're calling from. And well, Duani, Cecile, and a oh, Abby is in Costa Rica. They're in different spaces, places right now. And I'll let them introduce themselves around that. Um, and we are part of the Peace Education Master's Program. So I'm the faculty member and Duwani, Cecile, and Abby are students within that program, um, almost finishing uh, working on internships and theses and things like that right now. Um, and the inspiration for this session came from our experience last year, I would say, dancing within and sometimes very literally dancing uh, within this space of the pains and possibilities of reimagining higher education within. So within the peace education program, we are um, studying, learning, engaged in praxis around that. How do we, um, how can education be a vehicle uh, for creating a more peaceful, just world. And, um, and then doing that within a structure that doesn't necessarily support that all the time. Um, and so in the course, and actually maybe, so to tell the story of the pedagogy of howling, it really came from an exercise that Abby guided us through. Um, one day. Abby, do you want to take it from here and share a little bit about that exercise and how we came to how? <laughs> yeah, sure. 
Um, good morning or hello, everyone. I shouldn't say good morning. It feels very morning for me, <laughs> but hello. Um, yes, I see some nuts. Um, yeah, so this piece, well, this idea of howling for our cohort, for our class started, um, I had a day of facilitation in our peace education course themed around resistance in education and healing. Um, and when I planned that facilitation, I wanted us to get to resist some of our own traumas and difficulties that we may have experienced in our schooling um, and experience healing and peace education through that resistance and kind of play around with experiencing what it felt like to resist some of those things and if it was so serious and why so serious and so we talked about some of the silly little things that we aren't allowed to do in school um, or weren't allowed to do in school so I talked about um for example, how when I was in, in middle school, as we say in the United States, or those middle grades, like sixth through eighth grade, um, that we weren't allowed to chew gum. And it ended up creating this whole gum trade economy at school to chew gum, to hide the gum, to get away with gum in the bathroom, to put the gum. And like it created a worse system where why would anyone even need that much gum other than to resist the rules and to break them. Um, and another of our, you know, moments of resistance was howling. And um, Stephanie, can I share a bit of your story with howling? Yeah, maybe you don't name names. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No. Uh, well, and Stephanie had shared with us prior in the year that she had an incident where, um, she and a class wanted to howl and make noise in a class and we're told to quiet down and we oh, talked a lot have to it, so it was actually a student presentation a student was giving a presentation we weren't doing anything really subversive or radical at the time but we were <laughs> told to to quiet down Perfect. So, I mean, we talked a lot about like the need, the requests in school to be quiet, to stay still, to not touch, to not break those barriers. Um, and, and yeah, and we luckily, we were very blessed in our class space to be in this beautiful bamboo hut outside close to the woods of Costa Rica on the side of a mountain. Um, so we had the space to break rules as well in a and still, you know, resist, but feel comfortable and safe in doing that. And so we decided to howl together um, as a form of resistance, release, freedom, collectiveness, collaboration, unity, whatever else. Um, and we howled three times and it felt good. And our class continued to howl. That became our thing. Um, we talked a lot about howling and why that felt good and what it meant to us and, and how that brought us together and the wolf as a symbol as well. Um, and we it held our way through our entire year and we we ended the year howling at graduation in front of our cohort and, and inviting them to howl with us. So howling became an integral part of our unity as a as a cohort. And it, you know, to me really symbolized that unity as well as resistance in a pretty harmless and collaborative way. Yeah. Anyone feel free to add on to that? Yeah, Dewani or Cecile, did you want to add either to that story or just your experiences with the pain and possibilities and some of the reimagining we've done together? Yeah, I'd love to share a little bit, even just about how um, this session has come about for us and how we've been able to name um one of our practices um and and put put it put it down in words so i feel like that opportunity for us uh came about when um stephanie our professor and beautiful space holder um she received an opportunity a call to submit an article uh to a feminist peace pedagogy journal and uh the collaborative community driven soul that she is, she brought this opportunity to us to our classroom and said, I can't imagine uh, writing this article without you all. And so she invited us six women in the classroom to collaborate with her on an article 
uh, which was my first academic article that we published, which I'm so grateful to have done um, with my posse, with my my Peace Ed family. Um, and so even the fact that we were able to come together and write an article and call it a pedagogy of howling um, and still have it deemed academic. Uh, <laughs> I think that was an eye opener for me in my practice of academia and also so inspiring to see our professor having modeled this for us and having created the space for us. Um, so thank you, Stephanie, for, for bringing this to life and uh, for, for all the connections that have brought us here at this space with Ecoversities and our community here. Um, I loved hearing all of uh, you all share. Uh, I just wanted to add one little thing. Um, yeah, something like we met uh, this past year when Thawani, Abby, and I were students at UPeace uh, in person taking classes, um, we met a lot as a peace education department. And um, I just am remembering this one reflection um, that someone shared, and I don't remember who it was, but someone shared that they were kind of like dreading this department meeting coming into it. And then um, it ended up being a very restorative gathering and left feeling better than when they came in or just like more whole or calm or they felt like the meeting met their needs. Um, and so I'm just like reflecting on how we were able to shape our classes and our meetings um, to meet our needs and how, yeah, just <laughs> that is so like so far from what um, traditional classes are like, I feel like. Um, so, yeah, that's something that's kind of coming up as, as what set our um, department apart from my past experiences. Thank you all so much for, for sharing all of that. Um, it's rich to hear your reflections. Um, a couple of other things that were alive for me this morning as I was thinking about and preparing for this session. I mean, one is that I realized this topic, um, it's just one that I keep circling around. And like two or three years ago, I was, um, I was actually the first rec conference, I was writing my dissertation and the first rec conference actually really, really informed and infused my my dissertation. And I wrote a piece for Ecoversities called Dissertation in the Cracks, Playing with the Possibilities, Tensions, and Limitation of Reimagining Higher Education from Within. I'll put the link to the chat. Um, so I wrote that at the time when I was a doctoral student. Um, and then this morning, as I was yeah thinking about what's alive for me in this session, one of the things I do in this article is play with this technology called Vent diagram. So uh, I don't know how well you can see this. Um, it's it's like a Venn diagram, like many of you are familiar with, perhaps of a way of um, describing describing the relationship between two things and the overlap between them. But a Venn is a diagram that's meant to show the overlap of two statements that appear to be true and also appear to be contradictory. Um, and purposefully, the middle is not overlapped or, or is not named. Um, so making vent diagrams is a practice that helps us recognize and reckon with contradictions and keep imagining and acting from the intersections and overlaps. Venting is an emotional release, much like howling, uh, of uh, an outlet for anger, frustration, despair. It's a vent that enables stale, suffocating air to flow out. It allows fresh air to cycle through. Um, and this is from, I'm quoting in the article, we make vents in both senses of the word, tiny windows for building unity and power, emotional releases of stale binary thinking in order to open up a trip of fresh ideas and air. 
So this morning I sat down and was making a vent around the pain and possibilities of reimagining higher education from within. Um, so on one hand, you could write a statement like reimagining higher ed education from within is is useless or you know fill in the blank you could you could offer a statement around how um difficult or perhaps even pointless it is to do that but then you can also write a similar statement about how rich and powerful and possible it also is something i was thinking about this morning was how we learn many of us learn the story of separation through schooling, like our modern formal schooling systems are teaching us separation, individualism, domination, hierarchy, you know, from really the moment we enter a classroom um, in very subtle and less subtle ways. Um, and so on one hand, trying to undo that within a system where that is still happening is very difficult and can be problematic as well. Um, and at the same time, these moments, like figuring out those pain points and trying to disrupt them can also be a liberatory practice. So that was something I was sitting with this morning, like while we are embedded within this institution or these institutions um, that, you know, grew out of the story of separation, there are places where we can disrupt it and restory for interbeing, interconnectedness. Um, and wholeness. And then I was also thinking about maybe particularly here at UPS, but this is true of any institution, how we exist within the institution, but we are also existing within so much more. Like at UPS, we are in this incredible landscape, like the land that is holding us there is just, um, it is a very, very special place. Um, yeah, we have frequent visits from like toucans and butterflies as we are in the classroom. Our, in the peace education class, we're in a bamboo hut right at the edge of the forest. Um, and it is just an absolutely exquisite, it's like the classroom of my, my dreams that is a, a physical shape that's not just outside. We are basically, we are outside in this classroom and how we exist simultaneously within the institution, but also within nature, within the earth. And so how can we kind of flip that, flip our focus, you know, flip our attention even um, to, to nature as our teacher and like less attention and focus on some of these stuck energies within the institution. Um, and towards the flowing and the regenerativeness of, of being in the forest where you're just watching regeneration happen like in real time all the time. Um, and then the thing that really struck me this morning as I made, and I encourage you if you feel inspired to play with your own vent diagram, perhaps as we chat or, um, or later, but that when I looked at the pains and possibilities, I mean, the pains are heavy and I feel them like in my shoulders and um, and even like what I noticed where there were, it felt like there were more possibilities than pains this morning. On a different morning, that might be a different story. <laughs> um, but that was one thing I noticed. But then sometimes the weight of like one strand of the pain can feel very heavy and very thing as well. Um, maybe I'll pause there, see if Zwani, Abby, or Cecile wanted to offer anything else. And um, if not, we can also shift into some of your, oh, yeah, yeah, have a... thank you for drawing my attention to that. Yeah, yeah, please, go for it. Please, uh, Abby, or, or, or if you want to add something else or, or some of the authors of the essay, congratulations. No, I just wanted to point something that is coming to me as I'm, I listen to the story. Um, a very pertinent, the name of From the Cracks, because I feel that as the systems are broken, breaking down, is in the cracks where, where the new comes out. This is this uh, two-loop theory of change that said that from the inside of the system, the change come out. 
but that doesn't happen without an opening. And um, the times we're living in um, open a lot of cracks in the systems and, and you definitely uh, find a way to make a meaningful sprout and flourishing from a crack by the howling. Sorry. <laughs> um, but the one thing that uh, probably from the academia lenses will not be seen of what of this incredible achievement that you did by creating a howling system in a classroom is uh, like the transformative re re uh, rebellious way of creating a ritual in what you do because by howling you're not just challenging the, the institution that tell you stay calm, stay like that. You're creating a practice that bonds together community that calls the energies outside whatever dimension you want to do, but introducing into the dead mono, uh, monochromatic institution of formal education, a ritual with all the sprouts that come out of creating a, a ceremony. Uh, it is a very radical transformative, at least provocation. So um, I, I, I wonder how could we start put, bringing those categories of analysis when we uh, are interacting with nature, no? Like hopefully I see more and more in, in the mainstream uh, modern monolithical thinking, people are saying, okay, okay, let's at least pretend that we are part of nature and not an external observer. There are tons of traditions of learning that already know that we are part of nature, no? So this little ritual that you created somehow creates these provocations that nourish the seed of rebellion and transformation of the system. Systems, I believe, systems do not transform by the agency or the will of the members of it. Systems transform when they become obsolete to that. So as important, the rebellion of doing cracks and hitting the system and, and oppose it to that and being, um, make it naked the king so everybody see that the system is falling as important as that resistant and active rebellion it is the rebellion of sprouting and cultivating and taking care of the new that is that wants to bore you know so thank you for your story it was really really wonderful to be engaged in this conversation thank you so much for that beautiful reflection Yale. um and Vishba, I'll come over to you in a moment. Um, yeah, we do a lot of ritual. I think the Wani, your section of the article perhaps even talked about that, um, bringing ritual into the classroom. And even because in formal schooling, there are rituals, <laughs> but they're often devoid of spirit or heart, or the, you know, they're very rote and very oppressive. I small story. Yesterday, I visited a school here in Costa Rica, um, a, Mo a Montessori school, and I was a little bit surprised we got there and it was for the acto civico, the civic act was what was happening. And it was this whole elaborate like song and recitation around the flag, which very much reminded me of my own upbringing in the United States where we recite the Pledge of Allegiance every morning and you would get in trouble if I did get in trouble for not you know, saying, I don't believe in this and I don't wanna say it anymore. Um, as many kids I think eventually do. Um, so there are these rituals in like modern formal schooling that are like oppressive and unhealthy and violent even, um, especially the nationalistic ones. And then, yeah, like reclaiming ritual as a sacred act and how we can embed these practices within classrooms, like just arriving similar to how we did in this session, where we take a moment to just be together um, and notice that we're together and notice that, yes, performance is not ritual. Exactly, exactly. It feels very performative. Um, Sandra, for sure, <laughs> and we'd love for you to, if you want to share more. Yeah, just to 
beautiful. Yeah, you all. Um, and thank you for that reflection. I, I love what you said too about systems transform when they become obsolete. Um, here, I'm often thinking about how you know, we're in the tropical forest and the tropical forest, like the rate of regeneration is so fast. Um, I moved out of a house last week. I had had to switch houses. And in the few days I wasn't in the house, there was mold growing up from the floor because no one had been walking on it. And like the, the forest will consume, you know, regenerate things so quickly. Um, and to me being here in Costa Rica, that feels like one of the most inspiring um, elements is just that teaching of like nature will regenerate. And um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, maybe I'll just, just leave it there. But Vishva, go ahead over to you. Long time ago, long, long time ago, say about four years now five years maybe i met a person from costa rica in a gathering and he spoke about peace and new initiatives of peace in costa rica but he had come to visit india and then he also spoke about cocaine smuggling because where we see that there is no army, there we also see that there is a possibility of exploitation of that phase not being there. Now I hear you howling and the image of cats contrasted with dogs comes into picture and then, then I ask you, there is this positive space of in the regenerative space about Costa Rica. But then there is there's something else that is there outside the confines of the institute. And there's howling. How are you dealing with all of that? It's a really beautiful question, Vishva. Um, yeah, for which was referencing that Costa Rica doesn't have an army, um, which I do, similar to the mission of you, Peace, I feel like the existence of a, a country without an army is an inspiring thing. Um, is Costa Rica still militarized? Like, definitely. Um, the police force here is militarized. So there's no army, but there's still militarization. There's still policing. Um, so getting rid of the army is just like one one thing um and there definitely are i mean the the landscape of peace here is complicated um as you mentioned uh, narco trafficking is is a big issue um just down the road from the i just learned the other day down the road from where i live there was a, a key um like kingpin person arrested uh for um yeah drug drug smuggling related crimes um so it's it is definitely very present even in the the neighborhood the town where i'm i'm speaking from um and and even like the issues of biodiversity like costa rica has some of the like really really like some good laws um and there is a lot of environmental protection here and indigenous land defenders are killed. Um, and and so all of these are are present at the same time. And so so definitely getting rid of the army just by itself does not make for a perfect peace. But Abby, Dwani, Cecile, any of you wanna I mean Abby's been living here for a while. I imagine you might have some Yeah, no, I think I mean one, I'm very connected and feel very feel very connected to these issues and concepts and conversations and they're so deeply structural um beyond like what's even worth getting into in this conversation of course but definitely worth continuously exploring and pondering on a global structure on the way other global structures impact these things beyond just the presence of a uh, an army or even a police force um but global economies um yeah the systemic issues are so deep rooted it's pretty impossible to understand unless you're in it and even once you're in it it's still hard to pretty much even yeah fathom but I think with the idea something that in my 
connections to the communities I'm part of in Costa Rica. And I've been in Costa Rica for a bit. I've been, I was living here before I was studying here. Um, is similar to go back to this idea of howling is when wolves howl, they're able to do it in a way with their frequencies where even a group of two wolves could howl and create a sound that lets another pack un be unaware of their size and strength. So two wolves can howl and convince another pack that they have 50 wolves. Wolves can't identify the size of another pack based off of their howl. That's part of why they do it. Um, and I think that's also so powerful is this idea of unity and strength in a collective regardless of size. And sometimes we just look for like, I need to gather people or resources. I need to have an institution to support me. I need to have funding to support me. I need to have someone in a position of power to support me. I need to have whatever. Um, I need a military to protect me, whatever it is. Um, but I think really what you need is a strong community, regardless of the size. You need a strong sense of unity. And that's something that I have not, I've never experienced something as strong as the community I am connected to in Costa Rica, which I am connected to a very struggling in an outward way community in Costa Rica. Um, but in an internal way, I don't think they would call themselves struggling. I think they're the most robust, strong, connected um, community that I've ever been a part of, regardless of access to resources, regardless of violence that perpetuates in due to structural issues. Um, and so I think that just going back to the inspiration we can take from the wolf, it shows that we can pull together with regardless of size, strength, resource, outward, you know, respect, anything like that. Um, and come together and make change or resist these, these harms um, and even resist just global perspectives that do perpetuate different kinds of um, further furthering of these in inequities that exist. So I think that <clears throat> Costa Rica is really unique. There are issues in these structures, but there's also a really powerful opportunity with this culture of community that exists. And that's something that I try to continuously pull um, inspiration from in my own work as well and honor and respect as I slowly become more integrated into. Thanks, Abby. Um, Blani and Cecile, I'm wondering if either of you have anything you want to share in addition. And I know both of you had questions that you were thinking to offer to the shared space, so we could also shift towards that as well. Yeah, I'll write my questions in the chat. Um, and if they speak to anyone, please go ahead. But I see someone has their hand up. Great. Well, thank you, Cecile. <clears throat> Shale, go ahead. Am yeah. I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes. I am just, my mind is heading towards a direction where I'm thinking. So there must be that set of wolves that really, the real wolves that really thought like there is something in this. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining that there should be an Abbey among the wolves who thought like there's something in this, you know, I don't think like the thing, the species started with this idea of wolves or maybe the dogs, but there's some, there was some class where there was Stephanie Wolf and there was Abby Wolf that started that thing and that, that evolved into that. We can imagine a wolf without a howl now, but somewhere back, the great, great, great grand wolf started that. And I, I feel like I'm going to take this experience as, uh, of meeting the wolf that started. <laughs> so I'm going to validate this meeting as like, so I maybe I'll tell like, Abby is the wolf that started howling <laughs> and, and going to celebrate because we, f we barely see that intelligence in animals, like, you know, but, but yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like the story is not very different the way it started, you know, so, so that really changed the way the species thought. So maybe, maybe this is how it begins. Uh, so, so yeah. I just wanted to share that thought that was coming 
back in the mind but yes yes it is it is it is a uh, you know it is an indicator of a rupture for me uh, like the rupture in the cocoon uh, or the rupture in the seed that is starting something very important and maybe it's it's a yarn for somebody else i am a part of this international co-counseling thing where yearning is very encouraged as an expression which is which is really prevented in schools like oh, you can't be lazy you know kind of a thing like there is certain discipline to be in the class and so forth so i was like for me initially you know it felt like the celebration and acceptance of yearning in the class kind of thing so so yes yes i'm loving it yes thank you Thank you, Shail, loving and appreciating that reflection. And, and Vishva, also, these follow-up questions in the chat are so rich. I'm going to need to sit with them for a while, but I love, love, love the questions. Um, and Cecile put these questions in the chat. She's curious about your experiences with student-teacher collaboration and disrupting higher ed hierarchies established by formal education. And what are strategies you've used for challenging the violence of formal education from within the class of these institutions? So welcome, welcome. So I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, 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 want, I will be very disappointing because my way of uh, tackling those questions still was abandoning uh, formal education. I, uh, I renounced to, to use my, my degrees. No, so and more and more, even my name, I'm Jeyo, more than anything else in this world. And started the Universidad de la Tierra in Oaxaca, that was one of the first uh, self directed learning systems in Mexico, at least. You know, um, but um, what I want to say, like about the disruption in the system, it is. It is, as I said before, it is as important as rebelling or, or, or make it evident the oppression. It is to start building new things. And um, I'm going to go back in the howling and the rituality on it because, um, um, and, but before that, I forget it, Sh uh, Shael. Great, including the yawning and go radical, include like farting into the class. Like that really bond people in. Like it's a a coercive practice that I'm trying to impose in our in our session. Um, so the thing is that modernity and sorry to say it for you the educators, but schooling in modernity have really created conditions of separation of humankind of the rest of nature, and the only way they have uh, found it to restore that integration is through rituality, spirituality, and deep commitment to the uh, creation kind, the ones that we see and the ones that we don't see. The problem with that is that, and I was talking with it with Elena Pardo, a, a Peruvian wise uh, grandma of the Ecoversity, that the problem is that every time we go and rescue a sacred side of the ancestors, then the institutions, government, national states came and make a museum or Disneyland or some for-profit um, amusement for tourism. You know, so we cannot really recover the 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 sacred spaces as sacred. So. I do believe that uh, one of the most important tasks right now is to reinvent, reimagine, and reclaim new sacred sites. And because, sadly, uh, education institutions are still one of the most populated public places where people convene and meet. Uh, and uh, uh, this will try to answer a little this relation teacher-students. Uh, one of the things have we sacredly create the the opportunity for those divisions to be erased like teachers and students are the same when we're praying when we're in ceremony when we're in ritual because every piece of the circle of whatever 
shape your ritual takes, your ceremony takes, equally to us, because we're all a, in a mission for the same purpose, no? So that is the crack, I think, that we could start. And, and, and we are all like really wanting to the board rituality, spirituality, reconnection, no? So that is a very seductive way to invite people to open their mind and rethink the, uh, the, the, the way that, uh, that we approach to learning and to relationality, to create relations because that's the best way for learning. And the other side of this product is joy. So that's why they downing, farting, dancing, whatever make you laugh, included with the with the discipline of ceremony and ritual, bring the balance that will make a system that I want to live in uh, uh, before I could exceed the system that is falling over me. You no, know? that's what I'm saying, sprouting the new. To make obsolete the other, we need to make this one more attractive. That's one of the things I learned creating the Unitierra. Like people are running out of formal institutions and looking for more and more self-directed learning processes because it seems to be more, at least more fun than, than going to school. You know? So let's make it fun and, and secret. I love that, I love that, Yayo, thank you so much. Um, the last thing you said, so I always have a learning altar in the classroom space, and there's different things on the altar. Usually, like if we've done some readings, I bring the books that we're reading that day, not as a way of putting the authors on a pedestal, but as a way of really like honoring the words that we're reading, the hearts that went into it. Because often one of the things, one of the points of separation, right, is that, these words can become very abstract. And it's like, there's a human who wrote this from their heart and their mind and their experience. And let's remember who that person is. Um, but one of the things that's always on the altar is a clown nose um, as a, a way of symbolizing, like we, we try to invoke joy and play as a way of um, healing, as disruption, as you know, the way that people know, people have learned for millennia, right? It was through play, it wasn't through memorization, it wasn't through reading even, right? Um, and uh, yeah, just in always invoking that energy into the, the space. Um, Dwani, Cecile, Abby, I'm wondering if either any of you had additional reflections or anyone, I'm noting time, we have about 10 minutes left. And I think um, I'd love to leave a few minutes to read a closing poem from our article and also maybe a song <laughs> if we have time for that. Um, but are there, yeah, for anyone in the room, is there something burning that wants to be shared around this, these themes we've talked about today, which is such a rich discussion. I love the yawning and fighting as well. I'm fully going to be bringing that to class on Monday. <laughs> Bring some roses. I have a poem too that I'll, I I can put in the chat. I, this is oh. the poem that is going through my mind through the whole conversation of the conference, which is how we're learning new languages, how howling is a new language. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, thank you. And Adrian, yes, I will. Uh, the article hasn't the waiting publication, um, but I have a PDF yeah, drive copy that I can send link back in there. Um, the, what the wanted to also pick up on what Yeo shared about your student relationship. Um, I mean, to me, that is such a huge, um, I don't know. I mean, I think what we do together is all about relationality and, and community building and disrupting that hierarchy to the degree that we can. Like, and this is one of these tension points where at the end of the day, we we are existing within an institution where we've both, like I've signed up for the job, 
the Wani, Cecile, and Abby have signed up as students where like there are grades and there are ways to subvert that to a certain degree. But at the end of the day, I need to submit a number, <laughs> which is like definitely one of my pain points. Um, and we talk a lot about that as well. And, and we engage in lots of self-reflection, peer reflection, peer upliftment and feedback. Um, but part of my, because I hear people sometimes who are in radical education spaces within formal institutions trying to flatten the hierarchy. And it's like, to the degree we can, absolutely, yes. But let's also not like ignore the fact that there are still hierarchies that we kind of can't get around or or to some degree are still going to exist. Um, in the, the chat a little ways above, I put in an, a book that a friend co-edited with his students. His name is Hakeem Williams. And I just wanted to, to put a little plug for the book. Um, it's called Disrupting Hierarchy in Education. And they, in the book, they write about the process of, of editing the book together um, as professor and students and it being an exercise of disrupting hierarchy and the tensions and complications that also came along with that, but also the beauty and the joy of that process. Um, and one of the phrases they use in the book that I really love to describe the student teacher relationship is learning partners. Like instead of referring to each other as a student or teacher as learning partners. And that's, uh, uh, yeah, a phrase from the book that I really love. And Nwani put some, some other questions in the chat. Yeah, we do have to howl together. <laughs> we do have to howl. Um, are there any other burning comments, thoughts, questions before we move towards poetry, howling, and perhaps a dance party? <laughs> Uh, I love that, Yeo. Yeah, hierarchy is not evil by nature. Um, it, it, what legitimizes it is power and wisdom. Thank you for that. Love or that. wisdom, power or wisdom. Or, or wisdom, you... yes, yes, yes. <laughs> or wisdom has a power, I guess. Too. <laughs> um, my, my, my dream is that with wisdom, you don't need the power. Yes, yeah, I love dream. I love that dream. Well, thank you all so much for being here. May I? Um, I'd love to guide us to the howling. Guide us Abby towards or howling. Or yeah, the valley or so on. <laughs> like we came. We cannot to leave this room without howl. howling. Oh, yes. we cannot. I. <laughs> I am so glad. There's such enthusiasm for the howling. Um, I will put on, uh, or I'll read this last, it's the last poem of our article. It's how the article concludes. And then I'm gonna invite us to howl. And I will invite us to unmute. It leads to chaos as many of you have probably experienced with uh, in different sessions, but it's a beautiful chaos. And I think it's very necessary for the, the howling. And I just, I am lighting and joy with the enthusiasm for the howling. <laughs> My dog is joining in as well. I'll share this closing poem the way the article ends, and I'll even put words into the chat. So we make our offerings, but we don't ask them to be perfect. We embrace the messiness of creating a more peaceful world from within the violent one we are currently hospicing. We stay with the trouble of what in that entails and not giving up on each other. We operate as vines within the cracks of the colonial architecture of the westernized university, planting seeds of possibility amidst the crumbling ruins in the making of these institutions. We conclude our class with healing howls, an act of rebellion and release. Like bells of mindfulness, our howls echo across the campus and into the valley into the cracks to create more space within them for revolutionary love, healing, and collective care. Rough. <laughs> and with that, I invite you to join us 
in some healing hells. I'm going to face the canyon where I live, the beautiful howling site. And I'm going to try not to drop my laptop into it. <laughs> so inviting you to unmute. I know some of you might be in a space where you can't howl and that's okay too. <laughs> you can just listen and howl internally. So on the count of three, we'll do three howls together. Okay. Taking a nice deep breath in, unmute if you would like. Will, thank you, Will, and all thank of you, you so much, everyone. Thank you for your service, <laughs> and thank you, Stephanie, Abby, Giovanni, and all of, of the students that, that make this beautiful session. Thank you, Will. Wait for the yeah, next Tech Coast. Thank you so much, Bye, guys. Will. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.